My name is Ksenia Gerstein. I'm the curator of modern and contemporary art here at the Aldrich Museum of Art and the curator of the exhibition Myths of the West. These two pieces that you're seeing right here, Andy Warhol's Sitting Bull and Annie Oakley, were among the first works in the Ulrich collection that piqued my interest when I began thinking about the ways in which the history of the American West was represented in our holdings. I was then very excited to discover that the Wichita Art Museum's collection also holds two works from the same print series, and we're very grateful to Wham for lending their works so that these pieces can be brought together in Myths of the West. Andy Warhol created the portfolio called Cowboys and Indians in 1986, a year before his death. Warhol was renowned as one of the founders of the pop art movement, and he had a talent for distilling into simple and visually accessible images the key artifacts, personalities, and phenomena of American popular culture. In Cowboys and Indians, he captured the mythology surrounding the white conquest of the West as central to American identity. The different variants of Warhol's portfolio include a total of 14 different images. The four pieces you see here are particularly interesting together as a subset of that larger group because they're all directly connected to the mythologizing of Western expansion that took place in the late 19th century when this history was first being written by the victors even as it was still happening. George Armstrong Custer, uh, whom you see here, was in a very important way not a victor in the Indian Wars of the post-Civil War era. He is most famous for leading the U.S. troops that were defeated during the Battle of Little Bighorn, which took place in present-day Montana in June of 1876. Yet the way Custer was memorialized for many decades after his death is emblematic of the selective memory that shaped a triumphalist narrative about Western expansion. By the time of his death in 1876, Custer had been a participant in the Indian Wars for 10 years, spending part of that time right here in Kansas. In 1868, Custer led what many historians now call the Washita Massacre in present-day Oklahoma. Another work in Myths of the West, a painting by T.C. Cannon, alludes to this historical event, which took place not far from Cannon's childhood home. During the Washita massacre, Custer's forces attacked the Cheyenne Winter Encampment, killed women and children alongside male warriors, and captured women and children as hostages, likely sexually assaulting some of those women. Custer was likely pursuing a similar strategy at Little Bighorn while carrying out a campaign to force members of Lakota and Cheyenne tribes onto government-run reservations. Yet despite his vicious tactics and controversy over his military skill, Custer for a long time became an unequivocal hero in popular American culture. This image in particular contributed to shaping Custer's legend. It was created as an advertisement for a Budweiser beer in 1896, and over a million copies of this print hung at one point or another in bars across America. Custer's widow wrote several books to promote his legacy, and numerous counties, towns, and other sites were named after him. In the end, the myth of Custer's heroic last stand overshadowed any nuanced understanding of his life, let alone questions about the government policies that he was carrying out when he died. Facing Custer is Geronimo, an Apache leader whose life also exemplifies the way popular entertainment in the 19th century promoted white narratives about Native Americans. Geronimo spent 36 years fighting against U.S. and Mexican armies in response to incursions on Apache land and efforts to move the Apache onto reservations. In 1851, when he was 22, the man who would later be nicknamed Geronimo witnessed the murder of his mother, wife, and children by Mexican soldiers. The raids in which Geronimo himself took part in the years that followed also resulted in the deaths of numerous non-native and native civilians in both Mexico and the U.S. After Geronimo surrendered in 1886, he became a prisoner of war and was held by the U.S. government until his death in 1909 in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. During his 23 years of captivity, he became a celebrity of sorts with the consent of the U.S. government, which sent military guards to accompany him while he was on display at fairs Around the same time, Pawnee Bill's Wild West show negotiated with the government to have Geronimo join the show. This allowed him to leave his imprisonment and make money off of his fame, but it also presented him to the public as, quote, the worst Indian that ever lived, 
and perpetuated stereotypes of all Indians as lying, thieving, treacherous, and murderous. The other two individuals seen here are the sharpshooter Annie Oakley and Lakota leader Sitting Bull. Their biographies are further testament to the way late 19th century Wild West shows as a form of popular entertainment shaped the mythology of the West. Sitting Bull was an influential Lakota leader. He united several Plains Indians peoples in resistance against being moved onto reservations, and it was his large encampment that Custer's men attacked at Little Bighorn in 1876. Sitting Bull evaded U.S. capture for five years after that, and ultimately was killed by Indian Agency police in 1890 at the Standing Rock Reservation. In 1885, however, he spent four months performing with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. There, he developed a close friendship with sharpshooter Annie Oakley. Oakley had also joined the show in 1885 and stayed with Buffalo Bill until 1901, becoming his highest paid star and a household name. The Warhol images we see here hint at the fact that it was popular entertainment like the Wild West shows that crystallized the tropes of Western life we take for granted. These shows emerged in the 1880s and lasted as late as the 1930s. Through their spectacular live acts, which included supposed reenactments of Custer's Last Stand, among other stories, the shows focused on Plains Indians as the representation of all Native peoples and portrayed Native Americans as skilled but savage adversaries whose role in the shows was always to attack whites and ultimately to be conquered. It was also in the Wild West shows that the white cowboy emerged as a romanticized hero of frontier life. It's interesting to note that Buffalo Bill's show and performers, including Annie Oakley, were filmed as early as 1894 with Thomas Edison's Kinetoscope. In 1917, Buffalo Bill Cody starred in the film, The Adventures of Buffalo Bill. The stories and tropes found in Wild West shows, as well as some of the actual performers, migrated into and became a major influence first on silent and later on sound cinema, where hundreds of films made during the 20th century would establish the Western as perhaps the most American of film genres and give us the cliché versions of cowboys and Indians that Andy Warhol alludes to in his series.